Bonjour! We are live from Paris Retail Week. This is the Freedom Play session from Plastic to Pixels, and I'm your host, Natalie Berg. Today, we are going to be talking about the rise of digital payments. We're going to be looking at some brand new research from Freedom Pay and Retail Economics, and we're going to specifically explore the prediction that in the UK, over the next decade, digital wallets will overtake traditional card transactions. So, Joining me on today's panel, we have Ferry Stern, Vice President of Partnerships at Freedom Pay, and Richard Lim, Chief Executive of Retail Economics. So a very warm welcome to the panel. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. And now before Bonjour. I start throwing questions at you, I'm actually going to pass the mic over to Richard, who's going to talk us through some of the initial findings of the research. Okay. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so what we really wanted to do is provide that view of the importance of payments, the importance of digital wallets throughout the customer journey, um, and provide <coughs> that context around different forms of payments, how it's affecting the customer journey, how different customer cohorts are reacting um, today, and what we expect them to do in the future in terms of driving fri more frictionless customer journeys, the impact on things like loyalty, but also trying to understand some of the nuances between different sectors as well. Just as um, a high level um, piece of analysis that we conducted right at the beginning to really contextualize what's happening within the payment space, what we, want, what we did is we looked at the proportion of payments across different, um, different, um, different uh, forms of payments. And at the moment, what we've got is about 17% of um, of payments that occur on digital wallets today. There's a significant difference between different groups of cohorts, uh, different groups of consumers, depending on age, depending on affluence, and also uh, there's some regional uh, variations as well. But what we, what we found is that there's about 17% uh, of, of, uh, of payments that occur on digital wallets today. For some groups of consumers, they're already spending more on digital wallets than they are on cash. We expect that to accelerate aggressively over the next decade. And so what we see is that 17% as a proportion of payments rise to about 40% by 2033. And it's at this point where we see digital wallets as a proportion of payments overtake plastics. So your traditional credit card and debit card payments. So at that point as well, we're expecting um, digital payments to uh, digital wallets to account for about 210 billion pounds worth of spending across retail, hospitality, and leisure. So some really aggressive growth. Right. Thank you, Richard. I mean, that's some phenomenal growth. By 2033, 40% of spending will take place through digital wallets. And I'm curious to get both your views around the coexistence of digital wallets and other forms of payment. Do you think that eventually, maybe not in 10 years, but maybe in 15, 20 years, that um, traditional plastic cards will become obsolete in the same way that checks have, for example? Sure. Um, I think <clears throat> if we look at a wallet as a, as a payment instrument, as a consumer's payment instrument, wallets at the moment are, it's a moment in time in relation to that payment technology. So think back to 2010 when contactless cards were the next way to pay. Uh, they were, <clears throat> I think it was the London Olympics where they were trialed for the first time. And really consumer adoption took until pre-pandemic, sorry to use the P word, but mm -hmm. it was kind of 2019, 2020 before full consumer penetration happened with contactless payments. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a similar um, market penetration with wallets as it is today. I think for me, the key benefit is ensuring that the merchant benefits are married against the consumer benefits of whatever payment instrument they are using within their, within their wallet options. Um, <clears throat> and I think once you marry that synergy between merchant convenience and acceptance at the point of sale, irrespective of channel, with uh, the consumer adoption and penetration, you, you hit that sweet spot. But mm. to answer your, your specific question specifically, um, I, think, I think wallets are at a moment in time now where they are, you know, the, Richard has spoke to their growth, um, and they are the, the, the prevalent payment instrument, or fast becoming the prevalent payment instrument, somewhere in line with kind of cash adoption at the moment as well. I think, Richard, are they, they're similar percentages of usage uh, right now, but in 10 years' time, mm. that's going to massively accelerate. Yeah, exactly. And so we see that trade-off between consumers shifting more of their payments towards digital wallets at the expense of other payment methods 
cash is going to be one of the, of course, one of those areas where we'll see fewer and fewer uh, cash transactions. Part of that's going to be driven by consumers and the fact that they're embracing this type of technology, but also driven by the industry as well. There's a, you know, a number of different, for example, hospitality players in the UK who no longer accept cash payments when you're going to you know, pay, uh, pay for a, a restaurant meal. So you're going to see that kind of being driven by consumer adoption, but also the way that merchants are reacting to the use of cash, which is also expected to halve over that time. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting, especially if it's the merchant that will, if, if they're not accepting other forms of payment, then that will naturally accelerate adoption of digital wallets. Absolutely, so absolutely. Yeah, it's coming from the consumer, but also coming from uh, the merchant as well. Now, you mentioned COVID. We don't want to dwell on the pandemic, of course, but I think we have to acknowledge it was a huge catalyst for digital transformation, more generally across the retail industry, across all industries. But within retail, we saw a huge investment in e-commerce. We saw the digitization of the bricks and mortar store. And specifically in terms of payments, I mean, you mentioned contactless. I'm just curious to get your thoughts on what you think the, the lasting effects in terms of payment preferences are um, from the pandemic. <laughs> Great, great question. Um, I think we saw, uh, if you like, an amalgamation of payment methodologies. That's a, that's a lot to unpack there, mm. right? But um, like, so, so the rebirth of the QR code, for example, mm. and volume, transaction volumes through QR codes has naturally declined, right? Because it was artificially inflated during the pandemic. Everybody scanning a QR code to pull up a menu option or to, to browse through a, a web store and then to complete that journey using a payment as well. But QR codes were, um, at a global level, were already in, in kind of wide circulation uh, in, in Eastern markets mm. pr prior to COVID. So <clears throat> I think you need to take that question through the lens of geography, through consumer behavior, um, uh, consumer, consumer um, preferences from a from a way to pay perspective but i think based on what we've seen after covid and kind of the decline of some of the more prevalent payment options um i think i think we'll continue to see a blend and it'll be driven by driven by what how the consumer feels m more com most comfortable paying with uh, less barriers to to check out if it's an online journey um and, and cleanliness hygiene is also a factor in terms of payments as well believe it or not Interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I'd, I'd agree with um, a lot of that. And I think what the pandemic did was, of course, it was a shock to the way consumers were interacting with retailers, interacting with brands, and, of course, the way they shopped, whether that was um, in-store and, um, and online. Um, and it was that shock that caused people to um, get over that initial hurdle, you know, that initial barrier of, um, in, in some people's minds anyway, of the adoption of, of, of digital wallets. But once they'd experienced um, the convenience element, um, the frictionless kind of like payment, a, a point of checkout, it was something that they kind of, a lot of retail, a lot of consumers, um, be, uh, yeah, kind of adopted on a permanent basis. There's almost like a bit of a step change, I think, in people's behaviors uh, in that area. Yeah. In, yeah. In, in terms of some research that Retail Economics and Freedom Pay created previously, Richard talks about a, a shock to the system or a blip from a consumer perspective. Mm. Was it an 80 billion pound blip? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it was, you say that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, a 54 billion pound <laughs> blip in terms of that shift towards online um, and, uh, and, and, and people returning to where the kind of the natural growth of online would have been had there not been pa a, a, a pandemic. But yeah, it was a significant shift towards online. Sure. But I think imp importantly as well, that shift towards online caused by the pandemic wasn't just an impact on the point of purchase. It was an mm -hmm. impact across the entire customer journey, how people discovered products, how they researched products, how they pay for products, and also just how they integrated uh, or, or, or how digital became more influential across each and every stage, not just yeah. the point of purchase. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, Richard. I mean, we were talking about this last night. We had a women in tech dinner, and we were talking about how um, the pandemic was a catalyst for uh, digital transformation, for driving online sales growth. But as you say, I think it's propelled us towards this more digital world, more hybrid mm -hmm. world. Um, but we're not seeing, I mean, that growth was never going to be sustainable, right? And, and naturally, as the world got back to normal. We still want to go into stores. It's just that as a consumer, my view is that 
uh, what we expect, our digital expectations when we walk into a physical store today are phenomenally different than they were pre-COVID. And that's yeah. where you know all the change we're seeing around payments in particular, I think, comes in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, can I come back to contactless payments? Because um, if we talk about driving, what will drive adoption of digital wallets more generally? I'm just curious, uh, do you think digital wallets will, uh, this will sort of be le leapfrog? Do you think that contactless payments served a purpose? And, and yes, increasing the threshold in the UK, for example, um, I think it more than doubled during, during the pandemic. And that, so that meant that suddenly with a hundred pound limit, shoppers could buy their weekly groceries or fill up their tanks and the things that they do on a regular basis. And I think that would have helped to drive adoption. But how, could you, I'm just curious to get your views on where you see that in the future and whether that was a stepping stone uh, and whether you know d digital wallets will eventually you know, come out the winner in all of this. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's important to un unpick what a wallet does, right? What, what yeah. is its function? Um, sure, you can store your, your cards in there. You can, you can upload your, your loyalty preferences in there as a consumer as well. And I think that, for me, is the key uh, USP when it, comes to, when it comes to wallets. You've got a consumer attribute in there, the instruments to pay, but also your preferences as a consumer the cards or the instruments you want to use to pay in certain, if, whether it's in a retail environment, in a hospitality environment, if you're using a certain card for work that's going to be expensed back out or if it's personal expenditure. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that whole amalgamation of consumer attributes within a wallet is, is what's driving the adoption because mm -hmm. payments are no longer about an authorization and a settlement, right? They, mm -hmm. What's woven into the consumer journey now is Loyalty is incentives, is rewards, is discount. Mm. In real time, that makes sense to me as a consumer. So <laughs> I think loyalty has been around a long time, um, but again, an acceleration of, of democratization of technology where consumers now expect a real time offer, reward, discount to be presented to them <clears throat> that makes sense to them per their, mm. per their consumer attributes. So I think that's where wallets weave that loyalty aspect with the way to pay. Um, and obviously the, mm. the, the functional benefits of wallets as well, where you can you know, use a specific card in a specific environment and, and reduce some of the charges at the back end from a banking perspective, or reduce mm. your interchange or your, your, your foreign exchange fees if you're traveling abroad. You can use a specific card for a specific payment. All consumer benefits. Mm. Um, but from a retailer's perspective, my opinion is the the weaving of, of the loyalty aspect with the payment journey as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And from, from a consumer perspective, I think it's going to be um, quite an uneven picture mm -hmm. in the sense that there will be different levels of adoption depending on factors like affluence, age, um, different categories will see the adoption rate differ. Um, frequency of purchase is going to be a really key um, uh, a key difference in terms of those levels of adoption. So for something like, so within the research, what we saw is that within food, mm -hmm. one of those purchases where are actually retailers are pushing for it for, for a number of reasons and already, uh, whether that's um, kind of insti instilling um, loyalty or they want to have more frictionless payments because of self-checkout and things like that. Mm -hmm. But food is one of those areas where actually consumers are embracing it. It's already integrated in a very sophisticated way into um, into loyalty and also into membership pricing in some cases. So there's some kind of functional um, purposes there. But from, uh, from the consumer perspective, it's going to differ by age as well. Younger consumers are more likely to embrace technology and also just affluence in, in, in terms of the least affluent consumers in the UK have much lower smartphone penetration. Mm. They have lower board, uh, broadband penetration um, at home as well. They're generally kind of less tech savvy. And so it's going to be uneven as we kind of head throughout the next decade. Yeah, that's, that's a really important point. And probably brings us to the next couple of slides that mm. you wanted to share. Absolutely. Mm. So what we found within the research is, um, th is that kind of uneven picture that, um, that I just spoke about. And generally speaking, if we just focus on the, um, the darker blue bars in this graph, on the right-hand side, on the y-axis, what we've got is a difference in terms of affluence group. And so at the bottom, you've got the least affluent 40%. At the top, you've got the most affluent 40%. And then across the, uh, the x-axis, you've got consumers under the age of 35 and consumers over the age of, 40, uh, over the age of 55. 
we can see there's a big difference in terms of the levels of adoption of using digital payments within uh, digital wallets within a physical environment. And so just picking out some of those key numbers, at the top left, you've got the most affluent, youngest consumers, 66% of which use digital wallets in store currently at the moment. That's almost, you know, that's what, it's more than twice the amount of the least affluent 55-year-old age group. So there's this kind of uneven picture across the levels of adoption of digital wallets um, uh, depending on age uh, and also depending on income as well. We also talk about some of the barriers as well in terms of adoption and so we, t we spoke about COVID and the impact of COVID and, and actually that first instance in terms of using a digital wallet for the first time and what this graph shows is that there's a really clear correlation between age and income as well. And so when people have used digital wallets for the first time, will they then go back to using debit or credit cards? And you can see there that for the under, uh, under 35 year age group, there's a clear correlation where actually they're not gonna go back to use those more traditional forms of payments. For the 35 to 55 year old age group, again, it's kind of the, the penetration rate goes down, but there's still that kind of shift towards digital wallets uh, more on a permanent basis. But when it comes to the over, eight, uh, over 55, year age, 55 year old age group, then we see that people have tried digital wallets and then may not necessarily embrace it in terms of permanent shift in their behavior. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. It's, it's really important to highlight, I think, those that disparity um, in terms of age and wealth. And I think it brings us to another interesting point, because you sort of alluded to this already, Barry, around um, digital wallets aren't just about the convenience. It's not just about you know having to not get your wallet out or remember your PIN, uh, which I never do anymore <laughs> since using a digital wallet. Um, but it's also it can also be about loyalty, creating more relevant offers, more real-time offers. But we are still in a cost of living crisis, and a lot of shoppers are still looking for value. So I'm just curious, to get your views around how um, alternative payment methods, like buy now, pay later, for example, um, can be enabled through a digital wallet. Yeah. Well, as Barry was talking about, understanding what the digital wallet actually does and the functionality mm -hmm. behind it, and we touched on um, different elements of this, but not only is it more convenient form of payment, but it just offers that additional functionality. Um, part of the research actually showed that consumers are really driving for more integration of technology and digital wallets being that kind of that glue that provides that cohesive touch points through different stages. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's loyalty, whether it's um, uh, membership pricing, whether it's just a more convenient experience, consumers are just looking at that um, at that, uh, at using digital wallets as, as at that consistent touch point throughout the, throughout the customer journey. I think specifically to BMPL, buy now, pay later technology, um, it is a consumer option. It's, it's another option, yeah. right? So yeah. it, should be, it should be prevalent um, with retailers that, that see its value. Mm. That, that serves their customers as well. Yeah. Um, in the same way, Venmo, PayPal, traditional card payments, alternative payment methods, mm -hmm. they all coexist within, within that bubble of optionality for the consumer, so they all, they all have their place. I think it's incumbent on the merchants to really understand their consumers. Mm -hmm. And if that is an option their consumers <coughs> are, are asking for or looking for, mm -hmm. and it's going to increase conversion rates on their website, it's going to increase basket size, mm -hmm. which ultimately, you know, that's what the web store or the, or the mobile app is there to do. Um, then that should be a, a payment technology that's enabled within that within that retailer's environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said you have to know your com consumer, you have to know your shopper. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's always been a fundamental rule in retailing, right? But I think today more than ever, considering the proliferation of choice that we have, um, and I'm speaking more generally, we, we, we shop on our terms, you know, we receive orders on our terms, whether we have it delivered to our home or click and collect. Uh, how we return items, whether we turn to restore or drop it off in a locker or send it in the mail. Um, you know, I think as shoppers today, we're, we're shopping on our terms, not the terms that the retailer used to dictate to us. And the same is absolutely true with payments in terms of just the incredible amount of choice that we have today as, as shoppers. And I guess, I mean, I guess the answer is knowing your customer, so I'm probably giving you, giving you the answer already, <laughs> but how do retailers manage all of this complexity? How, is, is, 
do they have to offer every payment option or do they have to really understand their customer and offer those those um, options that are relevant to them? Sure, so so there is there is a sweet spot, right? I, yeah. I think it would be, as a consumer, it would be off-putting to try, you know, take part in that, in that purchasing journey, get to the end of that journey and, and figure out there's a multitude of payment options or choices mm. that I'm never going to use, right? So, yeah. so why are they there? Yeah, which um, can also be off-putting, right? For sure. <laughs> Too much choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it, it's unique to each retailer. And if they're you know, big box retail, you're going to have quick one-click checkout there. You're yeah. going to use tokenization to get to get that consumer through the journey as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. Like maybe not as quickly as possible, but mm. they don't need to feel rushed, but it needs to be a, you know, a pretty seamless checkout experience. <clears throat> if you look at experiential model in high-end fashion, mm. for example, um, that's, that's all about the experience, right? Yeah. So you're not rushing your consumer through the door. Mm. Potentially, you're, you're taking part in personalized shopping with that consumer. You're engaging on a one-to-one -one with the sales assistant and that person. Um, you're providing them a lovely checkout, you know, a really gracious checkout experience that speaks to all the elements of loyalty within that brand as well. Mm. Driving brand um, affiliation, uh, ensuring that if there is a loyalty program that that consumer is receiving the benefits of that, of that scheme as well. Mm. Um, so it's horses for courses, but I think, I think you need to Look at your look at your vertical, your sub vertical, what sectors you play in, and provide <coughs> the payment options and the payment experiences that are most relevant for your relevant for your consumer. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. No, I completely agree with that, and and it's about you know understanding the customer, putting the customer at the heart um, of the business, and making sure that the proposition is tailored to you know uh, your core your core customer demographic. Mm -hmm. Um, but part of that and the essential, the essential role of, um, of digital wallets and integrating all of this functionality is, is around data as yeah. well. Mm. And so retailers need to have that data in order to provide a more personalized um, experience for their customers. And so, um, and so it's another way of collecting data on, uh, on customers, understanding how they can leverage that data to ultimately um, enhance the lifetime value of their customers. Yeah, and I, it, oh sorry, yeah. carry on. No, no, I was just going to say, and, 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 it, and, and that point is just is so important because we, you know, we're heading towards more data, more sophisticated use of data, how to provide more personalized um, marketing and communication to enhance the lifetime value of customers. And so, uh, and so this is a really important aspect for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you look at, you know, sort of what's happening across the broader retail sector, you know, AI is really revolutionizing retail and in the future it will continue to power more personalized experiences. Absolutely. And once that becomes the norm, you know, your customer is going to be expecting something very tailored, very relevant, and ideally something in real time um, for them. So I think that yeah. Those shopper expectations are just going to continue to surge thanks to all of this yeah. technology. <laughs> um, you've sort of touched on the, the what I call the divergence between frictionless and fun retail, so or experiential retail. But I'm just curious when it comes, take it back to digital wallets, which sectors do you think, and I know Richard, you touched on this in the report, which sectors do you think will be most impacted sure. um, by the rise of digital wallets? Mm. Yeah, well, in the research, we looked at the different um, use cases for digital wallets um, by, uh, by different sectors, and there's mm. kind of lots of nuances that emerged um, within that. And I think some of the really important ones is just um, the, the typical um, demographic Mm -hmm. for particular sectors and so when it comes to fashion for example this higher penetration um, amongst younger consumers more affluent consumers and so there's already that um, shift towards the use of digital wallets and also mm -hmm. retailers in this space um, whether it's retailers like Next or M&S or some of the large pure line retailers that are using and utilizing data they're already um, they're really embracing this type of uh, technology, so there's kind of lower barriers when it, when it comes to actually use, uh, going to retail and having that technology in place. But we saw uh, primarily food being that kind of high, f uh, high frequency purchase, retailers, the big, you know, the big re uh, grocery retailers in the UK already embracing this kind of technology, uh, apparel being another one, of those, uh, uh, another one of those areas where those are kind of like the three areas where mm. people are really embracing technology. 
Yeah, which makes sense. I guess food from a convenience aspect, but also um, fashion. There's such an opportunity to customize that experience through tech. So, yeah. um, and also, you know, the frictionless aspect is relevant there as well. Um, you touched on France. I'm going to come to you, Barry, for this. Uh, we are in <laughs> France, so it, I think we have to talk about some of the key payment trends uh, in this country as well. So, curious to get your views on, um, yeah, what you're seeing in France and sure. how uh, payment preferences are evolving. So I'll start by saying we are so excited to be at Paris Retail Week this mm -hmm. year. Um, I think our, our investment into the French market, um, I think is, is obvious uh, given, mm -hmm. given our positioning at the show, but we see France as a strategically very, very important market for freedom praise growth. Um, so we, we have be, had live customers in, in France for a number of years now, but at that point we were kind of driving international business, true cross-border business that doesn't cater necessarily for some of, the, um, some of the holistic payment methods that are traditional within the French market, so carte bancaire from a, from a debit card perspective. Um, we're undertaking a huge amount of work to, on our platform to be able to support local debit cards within the kind of traditional French market, which means we're not only a platform that's going to be catering for international business and travelers and you know, the international brands that Freedom Pay is associated with, but we're going to be taking that step and kind of supporting domestic French retailers uh, and support the way they want to pay and their consumers want to pay. So mm -hmm. we're really, really excited about, about driving adoption of our platform within the French market. Um, I'm super happy to be here as well. It's always fun times in Paris. Fantastic. Fantastic, and I wonder, um, again, looking globally, I know the research was focused on the UK, but looking, and it seems like the UK is, is quite progressive in this space. Um, I know just getting around, you know, the, my journey here, uh, of going from, you know, the London Underground to my Eurostar ticket, which again, I had on my phone, so easy just to, you know, scan that. And then I got to uh, Paris, Garden Or, and I had to get in line for a paper ticket. And I was just, oh, <laughs> it's such a shock to the system once you get used to using your phone for those things. So um, I guess uh, there's a couple of questions there. I guess just to start out um, with globally, are any markets, in your view, really leading the way and driving change when it comes to digital wallets? Um, I think if we look at the Nordics as an example, and, yeah. and a really interesting use case, you know, there was some, some data came out of, um, Sweden as a cashless society, mm. you know, it's ninety-five percent cashless society. Mm. That's fantastic, and and that's down to kind of technology adoption by the consumer, by a, a quite a young population as well that are yeah. that are tech savvy as well and and know their way around a mobile device, and and that that is the adoption, the technology they have adopted, and mm. it it kind of it leads the way in terms of in terms of contactless enablement. Um, wallet adoption, et cetera. But there's also that 5%, right? So 95%, yeah. but there's, there's a 5% there, which is the tech averse mm. generation that, that have no interest in using a mobile device to, mm. as a payment instrument, that prefer to have the security of you know, 100, 100 euros in their back pocket from a, yeah. from a cash perspective. Um, and there is a real, there's a real question mark over that, over that demographic, and is the industry doing enough to bring them on that this journey mm. as well? Um, mm. Just yeah. because 95% people feel comfortable with it, it you know, it, there is a, there is an additional 5%, and I think it's yeah. incumbent on stakeholders within the payments ecosystem to work harder at, at, at kind of awareness, education. Yeah. Um, and adoption, ultimately adoption, because you know it, it's not slowing down or stopping. To to Richard's research, yeah. yeah. But we just need to make sure these people over here feel comfortable with it as well. Yeah, because yeah, you still need to cater to that five percent. And uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, I don't know if you've seen in the Netherlands. There's a supermarket that's doing slow checkout lanes. So it's the you know it's the backlash to the Amazon goes and all the you know the scan and go and frictionless yeah. checkout. So. Some people still want to come into a store and have that human connection. You know, that might be the only conversation they have with a cashier. So again, yeah. it is catering to you know that smaller percentage of people that maybe are tech averse. And, and, and some so some of this came out in the research as well when we're it? looking yeah. at the barriers of adoption of digital wallets. Yeah. Um, the most important aspect is trust. 
Yes. You know, yeah. people uh, trusting that their payment details can be sec you know, stored securely yeah. uh, on a mobile device. And then when you split that down into age and affluence again, it's the older demographics who um, have, have a barrier of trust in terms of, uh, of, of, of digital wallet adoption. But also just in terms of um, um, friction as well, people are still prepared to use contactless um, cards. Mm. They don't necessarily see there to be a you know, huge benefit um, uh, as that shift towards, um, shift towards digital. So there's, yeah, there's yeah. a couple of areas where uh, there's barriers to adoption, but trust, yeah, trust was the main one that came yeah. out at the top. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And um, looking outside of retail, just briefly, are there any industries uh, that you think are doing really well in terms of digital wallet adoption? Um, hospitality, I think, I think yeah. you know, I'll let Richard speak with a little bit more kind of granularity to that, but mm -hmm. we see across our lodging, so hotels predominantly, that um, where they have, they might have retail concessions within their environments, they'll also have food and beverage and they'll have reservations. Mm -hmm. That kind of convergence of, of spend within a, a hotel environment is really interesting because mm -hmm. you capture three different consumer behaviors. You know, their, their reservation, which could come from a, a third party online travel agent, mm -hmm. but the, the property still needs to understand that consumer behavior. Then their food and beverage behavior, you know, in the bar or the restaurant, and their leisure spend, whether it's the golf or the spa, mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> tying all that together is, you know, is a really fertile breeding ground for, for wallet adoption in there as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so a absolutely, that hospitality is one of those areas. You know, going out for a meal, being able to, like mm. I say, there's and on both sides here. There's a there's a um, a merchant side where they're looking to reduce the amount of cash that they have to take, and so that shift away from um, uh, shift away from cash is, is ultimately helping to shift that digital wallet adoption. Um, but hospitality being that, and also going back to the functionality point as well. So whether it's buy now, pay later, or integrating, kind of splitting, being able to split the bill mm -hmm. within the digital wallet. So there's kind of other areas of functionality, and hospitality being one of those areas that have benefited from yeah. that. And again, addressing those customer pain points, things like being able to split the bill um, yeah. without getting out your calculator and having to divide by <laughs> however many. <laughs> um, okay, great. So Barry, question for you. Freedom has, has just announced a new partnership with WorldPay, and I wondered if you can just talk us through some of the details of the partnership Certainly. and what it means for the wider industry. Sure, so um, we're, we're super happy to be kind of announcing this week that, that Freedom Pay and WorldPay have undertaken a strategic partnership together. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a really good fit from a, um, from a technology perspective. So Freedom Pay has 22 years worth of kind of hospitality integrations and retail integrations at the front end of our platform. And that in itself kind of reduces um, entry into markets for, for new opportunities, existing customers. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really strong play coupled with WorldPay's kind of pedigree in global acquiring, um, it really marries the two brands together and our capabilities together really well. So we're, we're super excited to be, to be partnering with the WorldPay team and, and driving further consumer adoption of our respective platforms. Fantastic, well I think that brings us to a close. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights. I've learned a lot. <laughs> and for those of you who are listening online, please come to the Freedom Pay website where you can read more and download the full report from Plastic to Pixels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.